Amen, amen, amen. Can we give the Lord a big hand? Let's give the Lord a big hand. Jesus! What's up, Rock Church? How y'all doing today? Yo, y'all ready for church? Y'all ready for church? Let's give a warm welcome to all our campuses. Say East County. East County. Say North County. North County. Say San Ysidro. San Ysidro. And guess what? There are 11, I mean 11, there's 111 people, volunteers getting trained in City Heights right now. Right now for the city. City Heights! Let's give City Heights a big hand. City Heights. We are opening our City Heights campus December 6th, I believe, first Sunday in December. We're very excited about that. You just saw the video, so we're very excited about it. And there's a, that's a, going to be a great ministry. There are 51 languages, cultures in City Heights, 80,000 people in like six square miles. It's very condensed and, and a whole lot of stuff going on. So we're very excited to be there in City Heights. I can hear you all screaming down there in City Heights. And we also want to say hello to everybody watching on our uh, microsites, Coronado and all the other microsites and all the people watching online, and all the military. Let's all give them a big hand out there. God bless y'all. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Before we pray, let me just give you a quick overview of where we're at. If you weren't here last week, we started a series called All In. Everyone say All In. All in. Based on the life of Abraham, this six-week uh, series, this six-week initiative is designed to um, include and enlist all of you 100% to be all in in our mission here at The Rock, save, equip, send. Everyone say save, save. say equip, equip. say send. send. Let's try this one more time. The mission of the church is three words. Say what? Save, equip, send. Very good. Save. We want to get people saved through church, through online uh, ministry, through one-on-one, -on -one, through our outreach programs. We want to get people equipped uh, through small groups, through our life growth track. And we want to send people out and get as many people involved in volunteering somewhere as possible. Uh, how many of you volunteer somewhere? How many of you volunteer somewhere? Let's give all those people a hand. Amen. Amen. Uh, so over the six weeks, we're going to go through the life of Abraham, but we're also going to be challenging you to do stuff. Number one is get into a small group. How many of you have a small group booklet, the, the series booklet? Do you have it in your hand? Anybody get it when you get it? Very good. If you do not have one of these, you can pick it up. When you leave, we added 450 small groups uh, just for this series. And week two is this week, so we have a DVD. If you want to uh, join a group, you could text GROUP to 52525. It's, it should be in your bulletin, 52525. Uh, but like I said, we started 450 new groups all going through the same DVD series on Abraham. And we're digging deeper during the week. We're also going to be challenging you um, uh, to make a commitment uh, the fifth week a character commitment. As we look at the life of Abraham, he was all in. His name was changed to Abram, from Abram to Abraham. And so we want to challenge you to decide what you want, how you want to be known differently. I want to be more faithful. I want to be more diligent to read the Bible. I want to be a prayer warrior. I want to be more humble. I don't want to be as angry. There's something about your life that we want to challenge you to change in. Can I get an amen? How many of y'all can decide on 10 things that you want to be different? Okay, very good. Just pick one. Just pick one. And then uh, November 15th, we are going to uh, end the series with a financial commitment over the next two years. And it's called a one fund. Everyone take a deep breath in. Say one fund. Uh, in the past, we would take uh, financial pledges over and above what people give. This uh, time, we're just going to take a two-year pledge, which is basically, here's what I think I'm going to give over two years. There's so many people here who give generously. We want to add that up. And there are so many people here who are going to be stepping into this giving thing for the first time. And it's going to be a challenge for you to put down, man, I'm going to make a financial commitment. We make financial commitments to our sell bill. We make financial commitments to our mortgage, our car note. Uh, we want to make a financial commitment to God. And on page nine of the booklet is a card that uh, you'll fill out. And that'll be the day you just make your pledge. We'll collect the money at another time in December. But I want you to be praying about, God, do you, what would you want me to pledge? There's some of you who haven't started giving at all, so it's, it, it may be new and challenging, but it's going to be a great time for you to say, Lord, how generous do you want me to be to you? And to be praying about that. We believe if we can get all in, that we can collect over the two-year period about $75 million, which will all go to one fund, all to save, equip, and send. 
Amen? Amen. Let's get on our knees and pray. Let's get on our knees and pray. Y'all ready? How many of y'all watched football yesterday? How many of y'all going to watch football today? How many of y'all don't care? I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> Lord Jesus, I pray you bless those people. Lord, I pray you bless us that have to have football. <laughs> just bless us because we just want to be blessed. <laughs> Lord, uh, thank you. Thank you for being more important than any sport man can invent. Thank you for being more important than anything we could buy. Thank you for being God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give the person next to you a hug, high five, or a fist bump. Amen, amen, amen. Let's say Jesus. Jesus. A friend of mine came here one day and he heard someone say, who's the man? And then heard someone say, Jesus. And he looked at me. He's a pastor from the church. He said, what's going on? What's going on? I said, it's all right. It's all right. It's cool. People are just praising God. So if you're new, what we say here is, who's the man? Anyone can randomly say it at any time except during the sermon. And... Uh, <laughs> And then people will yell out in response, Jesus. So let's just, just if you're new, we just want to get you caught up to speed who we're at. Uh, so someone says, Jesus. Uh, someone says, who's the man? You would say, Jesus. And you got to say it with a dip. Jesus. Like that. Okay. <laughs> so let's see your Bibles on three. One, two, three. Say word. One, two, three. Word. One more time. Say word. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. First book of the Bible, chapter 12. My grandson is a year and a half old, and he is advanced. (laughs) His mother was saying that like like the second day he was born. He's advanced. (laughs) So uh, we've come to realize that she was right. He's advanced. He drives. He rides a bike. (laughs) Can dial on the phone, speak three languages. He's a year and a half. Um, and one of the things he thinks he can do is walk on water. Because when I play with him in the pool, I'll stand in the pool, and, you know, it's like two or three feet deep, and he'll just look at me and walk off the edge. <laughs> like he doesn't have a concept that there's no walkway, that it ends, the patio ends. He just thinks the patio keeps going, and he just, blah, 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 and just his next step is in the air, thinking, you know, and just walk, and, and he's trusting that I am going to catch him. But when he's looking at me, he's not thinking about anything else other than he is going to catch me. And he just, duh, 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 and and now he's over water, and his his feet are going into the, and then I catch him. Last week we started this series uh, on Abraham, this all-in series, and we looked at the fact that Abraham was called to have a legacy. Matter of fact, I asked you what you want said at your funeral, and what was said at your funeral will be a highlight of your legacy. And how could you have a legacy like Abraham? Abraham had a legacy where God did something, made him into a great nation, and through him the world was blessed. And last week we talked about in order for us to have a legacy that honors God, we would have to trust God, be used by God, and have favor of God. Today I want to dig into the trust aspect, that if we are going to be all in with God, we have to trust God. It seems very simple. Trust God. Say, I want to trust God. One more time. Say, I want to trust God. Trust me is a belief that someone or something is reliable, good, honest, and effective. Being able to rely on the actions of another person. Trust. And when Abraham was growing up in the Earl of Chaldeans, he was growing up, his father, him, were international businessmen. They traveled through the trade routes of Canaan and Israel and, and the Middle East. So he, and we also know that he was very wealthy. 
We also know that he had his own military, his own uh, uh, security force. 318 soldiers were born in his house. He used those 318 soldiers to save his nephew Lot from four kings when they were taken captive. So he was very organized. We also know that he traveled internationally from Ur to, to the Canaan to the Middle East, all through down to Egypt, back to the Middle East. We also know that he grew up in a place where you, they could read and write. They were very advanced. They were very educated. And they also worshipped many gods, many pagan gods, the moon god being the prom, predominant god. But Abraham somehow amidst a culture that worshipped many gods believed in one god. And God said to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to leave your people and follow me and I'm going to make you a great nation. And through you, the world will be blessed. So he did. He left. Took his nephew Lot. His family, all his household that grew and grew and all his animals that grew and grew and all his wealth that grew and grew. And he went to, uh, from, from uh, Ur, he went to Bethel, he went to Shechem, he went to Egypt, he came back to, to Bethel. And as he was traveling, he got to the edge of the promised land. His, his household grew so big. His nephew was also blessed. His household grew real big. They had herdsmen and shepherds and animals, and the land couldn't support both of them, and they started to have conflict. And Abraham said, Abraham knew in his mind, God has given me, he called me to this land, so it's mine. And he got to the edge of the promised land, and he says, look, to his brother, to his nephew, if you, we got to split up. So you either go right and I'll go left, or you go left and I go right. And I was reading this, I was wondering why he let his nephew pick first. Why didn't he say, look, nephew, you know, I'm your uncle. I'm the man. I supported you. I brought, I, you know, I've been taking care of you. God called me this, so you go over there because I'm going over here. That's the, I think I would have done it. That's what God gave me. But he said to his nephew, you, you pick first. And whatever you, whatever's left over, I will have. Whatever's left over, I trust God will take care of me. If you're going to trust God, there's going to come a time in your life where you just have to let go. And I, when I read that about Abraham, I wondered how he had the faith to do that and why he did that. Because when you see people trust God, there's, there's some underlying truth in their heart that enables him to, them to do that. I'm going to give you three ways and reasons why I believe Abraham was able to trust God and why he did what he did. Uh, but I want to warn you, at the end of the service... I'm going to ask all of you here who call yourself part of rock who say, I want to be all in. We're going to have a different kind of altar call today. We're going to have an altar call where we stand in allegiance to say, I'm all in. Because this sermon series, we're trying to enlist you into the army. Yes, we want you to be part of the solution of building the kingdom here in San Diego. And what I mean by the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Say kingdom of God. Because God has called us collectively, all of us, to fulfill his mission, commission, great commission, save, equip, and send. Can I get an amen? And so this, this series is designed to include all of you in that and say, I'm all in. I want to be in a small group. I want, to, I want to invest financially. I want to invest my time, my talent, my treasure. Moving forward, I want to be involved in some kind of ministry here in San Diego. I want God to use me. So at the end, I'm going to give you a forewarning. We're going to have us all to call. We're just going to stand up. We're not going to have you come forward uh, at that time, even though we will have prayer at the end in all those campuses at the altar for whoever wants it. But we want to, today I just want you to, at the end, stand up. And the reason being, if you were here last week, we did that. About 40% of y'all weren't here last week, give or take. So anytime you come on Sunday, people don't come every week. Unfortunately, I wish you would. I wish you would. You should try it. It's really good for your heart. I, I know in our culture, it's like, well, you know, I went last week, you know. Nah, it, like, like we should be with God every day. Can I get amen? Every day. So try it. Try coming next week and see what happens. If you're like, man, I, I was just here seven days ago. Wow, feels kind of good. Feel kind of good. You, you may even have a, have a re, 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 may realize your seat has been waiting for you for seven days. Let's read. Let's read chapter, chapter, chapter 13. We'll just start at chapter 13. Look what it says. Abraham says. Abraham says. To Lot, his nephew, please let there be no strife between me and you, between my husband and your husband, for you are my brother. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you go left, I'll go right. If you go right, I'll go left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the plain of the Jordan that it was well watered. 
everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was like the garden of the Lord in the land of Egypt. And Lot chose for himself all the plain of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from one another. How could Abraham trust God to let his nephew go first? Number one in your notes, in order for your trust to grow with God and trust to grow in God, you need to be sure of what promises God has made to you. It needs to be very clear in your heart what promise God has made to you. Why are you here? Why do you sing? Because God loves worship and he honors those who honor him. Why do you read your Bible? Because it's living and active, sharper than the two edged sword, able to discern the thoughts and intents of your heart. It can guide and direct you, empower you, and be a lamp to your feet because it works. God said he forgave you and would forgive you if you repent. God said he would take care of you if you honor him. God said he would discipline you if you deny him. You need to know what he has said to you. Look what it said in chapter 12, verse 7. Chapter 12, verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord. God told Abraham, Abraham, I am going to give this land to you. And guess what? That's all he needed God to say. If God has told you that he loves you, he does. If God has told you he's going to take care of you, he will. If God has told you he's going to get you through your hard times, he will. If he's told you he'll never leave you or forsake you, he will. You need to stop right there. You need to not go into what you feel, what you perceive, what you hear on the radio, what you hear on television. You need to go back to what did God say. Because if you start believing the, the, the media and, and, and your friends' gossip and what's politically correct and your, the latest thing in your head, you will be spun all around. Or your feelings. I don't feel God is here. That is irrelevant. You're not always going to feel God there. You're not always going to see God there. You're not always going to hear God. The fact is that he is God. And he has said what he said. He cannot lie. He cannot deny it. And so inst instead of trusting what you feel and what you think, say, this is what God said. We just finished a series called Fight Club. And, and we talked about fighting and holding on to God's promises. And saying, no, I'm not going to believe a lie. No, I'm not going to get discouraged from, from, from what I think. I'm going to trust in fact that God is with me and he never leave me or forsake me. And so when you feel like your trust is waning, stop tripping and say, what did he say? What did he say? Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. Number two. Number two. Build altars to God throughout your journey. Who? Let's look at what Abraham did. Now, you have to understand, Abraham came from a place where they only believed, they believed in many gods. Abraham said, I only believe in one God. And so all the people with him also came from a culture where they believed in many gods. And Abraham said, I believe in one God, the God of the Bible. Look what it says in chapter 12, 12 verse 6. And, and before I read it, let me say this. There was all these um, caravan, or it was a caravan route. In other words, when all the people who traded, all the tradesmen and businessmen would travel from city to city through a path. They would go to Shechem and Bethel and Hebron and Haran. And all these cities were caravan cities where they did business. And so we're going to see, when I name these cities, these are places where all the businessmen traveled. And what Abraham's going to do is he's going to go to these cities and he's going to experience God. And then he's going to build an altar and say, I experienced God there. That altar is proof I experienced God. And when I come back to that altar, I'm going to acknowledge the presence of God. So it's this caravan route that he's going on, all these, these cities that he, he went. Look at verse 6 of chapter 12. It says, verse 6 of chapter 12, Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem. Everyone say Shechem. Shechem. Don't spit on the person's neck in front of you. <laughs> It's just like, man, dude. Uh, and then it says, verse 7, And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And he built an altar there in Shechem. And he moved from there to the mountain of Bethel. Say Bethel. And he pitched his tent 
with Bethel on the west, Ai on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abraham journeyed going on still toward the south. Chapter, chapter 13, verse 1. Abraham went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, Lot with him to the south. Abraham was very rich in silver and gold and livestock. He went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he made there at first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Chapter 13, verse 18, the last verse. Abraham moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees in Mamre, which are in Hebron, and Abram, Abram, Abram built an altar there to the Lord. Everywhere he went on his journey, he experienced God. He built an altar to worship God, to acknowledge the presence of God, and called on the name of the Lord. Do you realize, do you remember and realize, at least in your heart, if not in your brain, all the things that God has done throughout your life to prove his presence in your life. Even when you weren't thinking about God. How many of you can honestly say, years before I gave my life to God, God was saving my behind. <laughs> can I get an amen? And I'll say to all you ladies out there, how many times you were walking to your car at night and realized there was nobody around or you were somewhere scared and you were just praying, Lord Jesus, get me to my car. Can I get amen, ladies? There's a, there's, a, there's a, if you drive here in San Diego, if you drive 163 south, as soon as you go south of 8, between 8 and downtown, you go through kind of about ballpark and it's a real treating. There's a, there's a, a pretty, there's a path right next to the, through the woods. I call it the woods, through the trees. <laughs> going, going south on the right side, on the west side of 163, there's a path where people run. And when I see ladies in there running by themselves, I start praying for them. Because I'm like, that is, I mean, I'm just saying, that's dangerous for me. If I was a girl, I'd be like, I, I'm not going there. I, I, but I, can, I hope that you're in there. Lord Jesus, just get me to the other side. Just get me to the other side. <laughs> because, it's, you know, you can, it's, it could be so desolate. But there's, there's been times in your life, guys and girls, where you've driven home drunk, didn't even know God. And you know, when you got to, you woke up the next day, uh, and you even said to your friend, I'll even make it more specific. You woke up the next day and said to your friend, I don't know how I got home. <laughs> Can I get an amen? The Lord must have been with me. <laughs> and you didn't even know God. When David killed Goliath, for 40 days before David killed Goliath, Goliath came out and talked trash 40 days straight. The Philistines were on a hill. There was a valley and the Jews were on another hill. Their armies were on two hills with a valley in the middle. And Goliath, 40 days straight, came out into the valley and said, what's up? If y'all can send one Jew out here to kill me, we will serve you. But if I whoop him, y'all serve us 40 days in a row. 40 is the number of testing. He should have known that after 40 days, he's going to get his butt whooped. <laughs> so he comes out. Uh, where's, your, where's your boy at? Send your, send, your, send your biggest champion. I'll fight him. And the Jews would run every day. So David, who was a teenager, he was a shepherd. His big brothers were at the war. His father says, go take some pizza to your brothers, bread and cheese. Go take some pizza to your brother. <laughs> Y'all need to pay attention when you read the Bible. Pay attention. <laughs> so he comes out with the cheese. <laughs> And he, and, and he hears Goliath, uh, uh, and he says, hold up, how is that dude cursing the living God? How is that uncircumcised Philistine cursing the living God and no one out there whooping him? So he starts going around the camp. He's a little kid. Yo, I could whoop him. I could whoop him. I could whoop him. His brothers, his bigger brother says, you need to go home with your little sheep. He says, no, I could whoop that Philistine. I could whoop that Philistine. And they say, okay, go see the king. So they take him to the king, King Saul. And he says, King Saul, I could whoop that Philistine. He goes, you're only a kid, man. I'm paraphrasing. He says, you're only a kid. <laughs> he says, yo, when I used to keep my father's sheep, used to. Everyone say used to. He was keeping his father's sheep the day before. <laughs> that morning, he, he left the sheep. He said, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. And he got to the sheep. <laughs> that always works. People love that joke. <laughs> he, he, was, he was walking into the king's tent. Brushing the sheep fuzz off his body saying, yo, king, when I used to keep my father's sheep, 
If a bear came after the sheep or a, bear, or, or a lion came after the sheep, I knocked the bear and the lion out. Boop, took the sheep out of his mouth and went home. And if it came after me, I was like, what? Put the sheep down, bap, bap, knocked it out and went home. He, this, is, this, is all, this is all in the Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's true, it's true story. I'm not making it up. And then, and then he said, if the Lord delivered me from the paw of the lion, if the Lord delivered me from the paw of the bear, the Lord will deliver me from the Philistine. What has the Lord delivered you from? If you do not know what the Lord has delivered you from, when he asks you to take a step of faith, you're not going to do it. Because you don't remember what he's done in your life. Abraham said, I got an altar. I experienced God there. I experienced God there. I experienced God there. I experienced God there. I know God's with me. I got evidence. And God has done so many things in your life that the devil doesn't want you to remember or he wants you to write off as a coincidence, an accident. But it was God. If you, the, the, your ability to trust God in the future or now is largely determined by your awareness of his faithfulness in the past. And if God has come through with you day after 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 day, and he says, now I want you to trust me, it's like, oh, I have no doubt, no doubt that God's going to be faithful. But if you don't remember any of that, and every day you got to start over fresh, I don't remember what God did. I don't know if he, he, he probably, he didn't do, uh, how are you going to trust him? Abraham said, no, I know, I got records. And I would challenge you to keep records of what God has done in your life. Number three in your notes, put the needs of others before you. Put the needs of others before yourself. Chapter 13, verse 8. Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my brethren and your husband, for we are brothers. In other words, Abraham, the adult, said, uh, this, this, we got to... We gotta, we got to stay friends. This is not good. Let's, let's fix this. The whole, verse 9, the whole land before us, you got to separate from me. If you go left, I'll go right. If you go right, I'll go left. So Lot lifted up his eyes and he saw all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot chose for himself all the plain of the Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Lot chose based on what he saw. Abraham chose on what he believed. <laughs> he said, oh, that looks really good. Abraham said, mm. I, I don't know what Abraham thought. But I, I know Abraham's thinking, whatever, whatever, whatever I get left is what God wants me to have. And Abraham said, I mean, Lot said, I like what I see. Abraham said, I like what I hear. I'm good. Verse 11, Lot chose for himself the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. And Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent as far as Sodom. The men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated, lift your eyes and look from the place where you are, north, south, east, and west. <laughs> he said, Abraham, you're good. Look around. All that is yours. All that is yours. What a coincidence that what he was left with was what God wanted him to have. For all the land which you see I give to your descendants forever, and I will make your descendants as dust of the earth. And if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants could be numbered. Arise, walk into the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. And then it says, Abram moved his tent, went and dwelt by the terebinth tree by Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar to the Lord again. God, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you. If God is going to do something in your life, if God is going to do something in our life, we have to be a, a people that trust God, that acknowledge all that God has done in our life, that are clear of what God has called us to do. If you are unclear that God wants you to serve him, Think about Jesus on the cross serving you. We can only love him because he first loved us. No greater love than a man can have for another man or woman man is to lay his life down for his brother. A servant is not greater than his master. And Jesus laying his life down for us is the example he has given to us. Think of all that God has done in your life. 
And as God calls you to step out in faith in your time, in your giving, in your sacrificing, in your serving, look around and see all that God has done in your life. Why? To make you happy? No, to make you his be the best servant you can be. To make you holy. Say holy. How many of y'all are married right now? How many of y'all are married right now? The, the, your spouse is there to make you holy, not necessarily happy. Oh, now you tell me. <laughs> now, I'm not, I, I'm not saying she or he's not to make you happy, but you shouldn't look at them as saying, make me happy. Because if that's your expectation, they will fail. But if you say, Lord, you have put this person into my life for me to love, for me to be a blessing to, and for us to, as iron sharpens iron, sharpen each other so we can be holy, if that's how you see it, and you see that God put that person in your life, that God put you here, that God put circumstances in your life, and all the th ways that God has saved you, delivered you from stuff, from yourself, how faithful God has been throughout your life, you can't but trust him. Because he will, if you walk with God, he will constantly put you in situations where you just have to step into the pool not knowing what's going to happen. Because that's what walking by faith is. And so in a minute, we're going to pray in all the campuses, East County, San Isidro, North County, City Heights, <laughs> City Heights, all our, all our microsites in Coronado, all the people watching online. In a minute, we're going to pray. And like I said in the beginning, we're just going to ask you to pray with me if you're saying, I want to be all in. I want to trust God. I don't want to try to take matters into my own hands and say, okay, God said this, God said this, but here's what I am going to control. No, I am going to let go. I'm going to let go. You will not ruin God's plans by being humble and generous, but you will ruin God's plans by being prideful and greedy. God, whatever plan you have for my life, I am going to trust you, and I'm going to be willing to take a step of faith and willing to take a step back and not try to control everything and make it happen. I'm just going to do what you tell me to do, and I'm going to let you do what you want to do. But if we as a church says, I'm all in, I want to trust God, I want to be like Abraham, I want to walk the journey Abraham walked and be a man of legacy, I want to be a man of trust, I want to trust in God, I want to be a man known and a woman known as a person who trusts God, and I want to be part of the mission here. Very clearly, I want to be part of the mission here. This series is about getting you involved here. Be clear, that is exactly what I'm trying to do. He's trying to get us involved. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Because coming here on Sunday is only part of the process. We want to come here and get equipped so we can go out there and help people. That is why we are here. So in a minute, we're going to pray. And if you say, I'm in, I want you to, I'll cue you up when you should pray. And then I'm going to ask you to stand in allegiance. I'm not going to ask you to come forward, but I'm going to ask you to stand in allegiance. So get your butt back in the seat, your legs ready. So, because I'm, I'm hoping that thousands of y'all are going to stand. Can I get amen? If God spoke to you during that sermon and you feel like you want to ask Christ to be your Savior, it's as simple as A, B, C. One, admit and accept that you are a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and he died for your sin and rose from the dead. And then confess yourself as a sinner and say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. So if you would like to ask Jesus Christ to be your savior, I just want you to just look at me right now and pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart, knowing that God knows you and loves you very much. Say, dear God, I believe that I'm a sinner I know the penalty of my sin is death, and I don't want to die and go to hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died and rose from the dead for my sin. And I confess myself a sinner and ask him to forgive me of my sin. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin and fill me with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, you just ask Christ to be your Savior, we want to know and we want to email you some resources. So if you just prayed that prayer with me to accept Jesus as your Savior, click on the link that just appeared, and we want to send you some free resources. God bless you, and we'll see you in heaven.